Hello and welcome to the World Economic Forum in Davos. My name is Simon Kennedy of Bloomberg News. And joining me today for an insight and idea is the World Bank President, Jim yong -Kim. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Simon. We've got half an hour to save the world. There's been a, a, a lot of commentary this week on, on finances and credit <clears throat> bubbles and currency wars. But let's zero in on something that uh, has the potential to, to shape our future for, for centuries to come, and that's climate change. It's something you've brought a passion to at the World Bank. And I'd like you to, to start maybe by telling us about the details of a, a report you brought out in November. Well, we, uh, we did this along with the Potsdam Institute. And it was uh, a, an effort to give a sense of what the world would look like at four degrees uh, centigrade, excuse me, Celsius warmer than, um, than the, the averages, historical averages. And it was really striking to me. I, you know, I, um, I'm, I'm trained in science, and um, I thought I was keeping up with the climate uh, literature, but I found out that I had not been. And when I really saw what it was going to look like and some of the estimates of when this uh, four degrees Celsius world could happen, I was really shocked. I was personally shocked. And I started doing some of the math. And it turn, turns out that you know, if it's the absolute worst case scenario, my children in their adulthood will be living in a four degree Celsius world. And what did that mean? Just some of the, some of the top line headlines. You know, the the, the, the uh, oceans will be 150% more acidic. Uh, there will, uh, the, the, the coral reefs would have been long dissolved. The fisheries will be fundamentally uh, uprooted. You know, some people have said that carbon may be the currency of climate change, but water is the teeth climate change. There'll be water fights everywhere. There'll be food fights. So in their adulthood, my children could be living in a world that doesn't even resemble the world we live in now, where the animosity, the, the fights over basic resources will be so severe that it will threaten human civilization. So I started going back and saying, so what about the work that we do? We build roads. We build bridges. Uh, we work on health care, education, social protection. All of these issues could and will very soon um, if we don't take action, be affected by climate change. And what, what were the conclusions on what you can do about this, or what we and what governments and other <clears throat> policymakers can be doing? Or yeah, should be you doing? know, there's a lot of different solutions. And one of the things that um, I asked my team about was, you know, when these um, uh, once in a lifetime, there have been so many once in a lifetime events that have happened uh, recently, when these once in a lifetime events happen, everyone turns their attention to climate change. And then the, the uh, suggestions that are given are usually kind of small bore. You know, well, you know, we can recycle, we can do all these sorts of small things. But what I was asking them is, let's make a list. What are the really big things that we need to do? What are the big things that we need to tackle right away? And uh, all the other things, of course, you know, recycling, th these are all important things. But um, what I learned was um, the one thing that we need, and everyone has said this for a long time, we need a stable price of carbon. And we need to find a way to make a market that works for carbon. And so we've begun talking to people. It's complicated. Finding equivalences, forest carbon, black carbon, these are complicated technical issues, so we have to work them out. But we believe it's doable. The other issue is we have these fossil fuel subsidies. Now, I was just in Tunisia, and they're struggling to try to find a way to remove fossil fuel subsidies. But they were very explicit. They said the fossil fuel subsidies help the richer people who have cars. And they're, they're, they're fundamentally not progressive. We want to protect the poor. The fossil fuel subsidies don't do that. Moreover, we want that money back. We think there are better ways of spending that kind of a money. But it's politically very difficult. But we should remove fossil fuel subsidies in every country in the world. The World Bank needs to help countries find a way forward. And the other thing is the, the megacities. The top 100 cities are responsible for some 60, 70 percent of the emissions. And so if we find a way to build green cities, that will have a huge impact. Now, it strikes me that those three major things could actually have an impact and change the, uh, the arc of climate change. You wear, I don't know if people can notice, but you're wearing the World Bank tie, which carries the motto, uh, our dream is a world free of poverty. Tell us a bit more about how climate change fits into that. P people might see the, the World Bank as somewhere <coughs> working with developing countries, a financial organization. How do you mesh those two? How do you uh, to unite the, uh, the climate change ideal and ambition with actually your, your mandate? Well, so if you, um, uh, if you look at the various things we need to do to adapt to climate change, there's no question that poor people are, are uh, the least able to adapt to climate change. Let me just give you a specific example. Droughts in the, the, the Midwest of the United States and other parts of the world led to uh, increase in prices of wheat and maize. And so who does that affect immediately? It's the poor. And what happens, we know and from our studies, is that they simply eat less. And so we're seeing 
that the climate-based uh, increases in the price of very basic grains in this case can actually have an impact not only on just um, you know, temporary increases in food prices, if there's malnutrition in children, they're stunting and they never gain that back. So if you, if you, if you increase the price of food and cause malnutrition in kids at a certain age, this is going to have an impact not only on their lives, but on uh, their whole families and even on the potential for economic growth in those very communities. So, uh, you know, the, the, the canaries in the coal mine of climate change are going to be the global poor. Those, are our, those, those people are our primary concern at the World Bank. There's no way that, uh, that we can do our work fighting poverty and not pay attention uh, to the impact of climate change. What's the, been the reaction of your shareholders, the people who, uh, who will fund the World Bank going forward? Well, I, I, th I think that uh, across the board, there's been strong support. One of the questions as I was coming into the World Bank was what's going to be the role of the World Bank in tackling these global public goods issues like climate change? And um, I, I, I think we answered that question uh, very clearly. Uh, the World Bank is involved in so many issues that could have a direct impact. We fund energy projects. We fund roads. We are working on the building of cities. There's so many things that we do. Agriculture. Um, we want to be sure that everything we do is aligned with this effort to, um, to, to, to slow down, to mitigate climate change. Is there a risk that in, in a world that seems to be emerging from the financial crisis and the euro crisis of last year, that relapse or, or, or other problems take, take climate change off the, uh, off the, uh, off the agenda? Because it's, yeah, it's, it is viewed as a, a problem in the longer term. It's always tomorrow's problem. Is that a problem? How, how will you try to avoid that? Well, I, I think that um, uh, you know, the, the drought in uh, the, the, the middle of the United States last year, for the first time, climate scientists said that this drought was related to uh, man-made climate change. And, and then Hurricane Sandy. And then, but we, you know, we, we, there's so many of them. The president of the Philippines, uh, President Aquino, was here. And he said, if you doubt the impact of climate change, just come to the Philippines. We used to have typhoons only into September. Now they're all the way through December. Places that were very wet before are now facing drought. Places that never uh, suffer from typhoons are having them. Uh, and uh, his representative um, to the meetings in Doha um, uh, said in a very emotional um, uh, uh, presentation, please, world, wake up. We're facing it every single day, and the poor people of the Philippines are, are feeling it the most. I think it will be on the agenda, and I think people are starting to put the, you know, connect the dots. These extreme weather events are related to climate change. We've got to act. And I, I, um, if we do forget it, I'm going to be there to remind, uh, remind people because it's something very real to me. And it just take one, you know, the water issue. Right? I'm a physician, and what we see is when there's problems with water, there's increase in diarrheal diseases, and there are more people who die from bad water than die from AIDS, malaria, and TB combined. So this is a very real problem in, in our faces, and I think it's my role to continue to remind people that we've got to find climate-friendly ways of encouraging economic growth. The good news is we think they exist without question. But how easy are they to implement? What would you like to see the governments do? Well, they're, they're, they're not going to be easy to implement. I, I'd, I'd like to see the governments really get behind establishing a carbon market. I, I would really like to see everyone work together to, to do that. You know, again, the fuel subsidies are something that we need help with. They're, um, the, 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 uh, the, the developing and middle-income countries, uh, the, the poor, the, the low and middle-income countries are going to need help to take that difficult but important political step. And I think the mega cities, everyone has to be involved in figuring out a way to build uh, clean cities so that we reduce uh, the, the, the carbon reductions. There's something that everyone can do. Um, what, we, what, we want to, what we want to be clear on is that it's everybody's responsibility to contribute. But we also want to make clear that we've now got to tackle the really big issues that can, that can uh, truly have an impact. The World Bank is already working on these things uh, just this week or just this month. Um, the IFC, which is the, the private lending arm, uh, raised $280 million, the governments of Britain, Canada and Azerbaijan, uh, for projects related to, uh, to climate change. What more do you think the World Bank can be doing and will be doing? Well, I, you know, I, I think that um, um, I'm having conversations with a lot of different people, including Christine Lagarde of the IMF, um, you know, various uh, ministers of finance, about, um, uh, about building a carbon market. It'll, 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 it'll take that kind of an effort. We're looking at everything we do from the perspective of climate change. We're looking at every single one of our projects, every single one of our energy projects. There are tough choices to make. You know, um, 
we cannot deprive developing countries of energy. They need energy to lift their people out of poverty. So every, in every case, we have to make very difficult decisions about uh, balancing the climate change issues with a fundamental need for energy. Uh, but we are now uh, using this lens to look at every single thing that we do to try to be innovative, try to try to come up with transformational solutions that will not only uh, spur economic growth, but will uh, do it in a way that's um, uh, uh, climate friendly. So then to your broader agenda at the, uh, at the World Bank, you've been there less than a year? Six months. Six months. And uh, you told my colleague in an interview the other day that your first six months have been uh, studying and learning and, and now you're, you're ready to kind of roll out a, an agenda and a plan. Tell us what you've learned in that, that period and, and how you might be looking to change the bank. Well, yeah, the, the most important thing that I've learned is that we have uh, an institution that's just full of people who are passionate about fighting poverty. You know, uh, there are PhDs in economics from the best institutions in the world. And um, when I scratch a little bit, what I find is this great, v deep vein of emotion and passion. They could have been working anywhere, but they're working at the World Bank because they want to fight poverty. So that's been great. We're, we're clear that that's what we're doing. But then the other part of it um, that I found was that we, we also know that we have to do it through what the IFC is doing in this case, which is um, uh, making investments and loans so that uh, countries can grow their private sector. You know, we just put out a report saying that 90% of all jobs in the developing countries come from the private sector. So we have to fight poverty, but at the same time, we do it by creating dynamism in private sector so that businesses can grow and jobs can be created. What I found is that the World Bank is just full of people who are passionate about that. Now what we need to do is to set some clear targets, some clear goals for us, and organize ourselves in a way that every day we're moving toward those targets. And uh, we're going through a major reform process right now where we're trying to uh, do some things that everyone wants us to do. Um, uh, you know, we're awfully good technically. Uh, when we work on a project, you know you're going to get the best knowledge, the best expertise, but it takes too much time. And so, uh, one of the things we're working on is just to really reduce the amount of time it takes to uh, um, get a loan through our process and then get stuff happening on the ground. Not easy. These are huge bureaucracies. This one's been around for 66 years, but we're committed to making that change. And we feel that if we can just get better, reduce the time it takes to get a project in, you know, by 60, 70, 80 percent. If we can do that, we think we can spur a lot of other activity that will be important. It's a great institution. It uh, needs to refocus on its fundamentals, which is ending poverty and boosting what we call shared prosperity. Uh, in other words, prosperity that's shared by young people. You know, in the Arab Spring, um, you know, we found that, that the um, uh, rates of unemployment were incredibly high among young people. Interestingly, the highest rate of unemployment is among young people who are college educated. So uh, they did not share in the prosperity of Tunisia and that's what caused fundamental instability in their society. It has to be shared with women. You know, we were not always on the cutting edge of gender equality, but what we know now is that uh, development has to put women at the center. And in, our, in, in our, our notion of shared prosperity, we think the most important uh, element of that is to share prosperity with future generations. End po poverty, uh, build shared prosperity, focus on those goals, look at everything we do, and move forward quickly. There's a lot of talk in Davos these days about the state of the world economy from an advanced economy point of view, something that probably wouldn't have been expected during, uh, or during the early part of this century. And yet, that takes away from the developing countries. You know, so we, a lot of the talk this week has been about, is the US in a sustainable recovery? What's going to be on the euro crisis? And then the emerging markets, the future of China and, and India and the like. Tell us about this, the, the state of play for the developing economies. Well, you know, the... Um the developing economies have shown remarkable resilience uh, over the last five years. You know, uh, the lion's share of the global growth of the last five years have come from the developing countries. So, for example, in Africa next year, we're predicting a, a growth rate of 5.5%. Now, you know, some people might think, well, it's because commodity prices went up. That's the only reason. And what we found is that in Africa in 2000, they invested, you know, about 16% of their, 16% uh, uh, of the GDP was, uh, 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 was in investments in infrastructure. Um, this year was 22%. So they've actually increased their investment rate. They're, in, they're increasing their investments in the, um, in the foundational elements that will lead to future growth. And also, 
um, uh, they've, they've done a lot of things well. I mean, we, we feel very proud that we've worked with these countries. They've done a lot of things well, good fiscal policy. Um, they've uh, invested in health, education, social protection. And so uh, there's a great story there. Uh, Latin America rebounded very, very quickly. What we're telling the, the, the developing countries now is, okay, um, you got through this period well. You may need to build back your buffers a bit, but focus on building those foundation for the next phase of growth. So it's a great story, um, you know, and in fact, the, the, um, um, the rich countries should thank the developed world for maintaining um, uh, the growth that we've seen uh, in, in the last five years. We're laser focused on making sure that they're prepared uh, if there's another shock and also that they're um, uh, building the foundations for the future. I'd like to stress test the, uh, the commitment on climate change. Sure. And two is <laughs> you've kind of, as, as, in anything, in, as you're learning in Washington, you get hit by from both sides. The environmental lobby has said, um, has questioned whether there's a hypocrisy that the World Bank's performance on <coughs> climate change in their mind has been questionable. Christian Aid, for example, says the uh, bank's funding of coal has uh, surged in the, in the past five years. Uh, in 2002, the World Bank loaned uh, nearly uh, four billion for a coal-fired power plant in South Africa. Uh, obviously, these are before your time. How do you, do you avoid those projects in the future or do you accept that in some places <coughs> you're gonna have to do Th things that will work against climate change, but they will work for the good of those, uh, those economies that need that infrastructure. Right. So a couple of quick things. So if you add up all the emissions of all the developing countries and you remove China, uh, all of the developing countries emit about a third of the CO2 that the US, EU, and China together emit. So it's actually a relatively small proportion of the overall emissions. And so, um, uh, uh, and I, I live in Washington, D.C. I get my electricity from coal power plant. So um, we have to be really clear about where we are right now uh, in, in, in the world. Um, I said it before, uh, our job is to focus on unending poverty. Now we do everything we can to avoid um, uh, 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 sponsoring coal projects. But you have to look at every single country and say, so is there any other option? So everything we do, we're looking at every single other option. Uh, and uh, only in the most severe cases where countries have no other option and where us coming in and helping them will ensure that uh, any coal power uh, plant will be clean. Now, I have not yet signed a, a coal fire project, and um, I would like to not. But I also am very much aware that my first priority is helping countries have the energy that they need. In countries like Kosovo and Mozambique, we're looking at every other option. But you know, um, uh, Kosovo, you know, they're, they're, they don't have heat. In Mozambique, they desperately need energy to take the next level, to get to the next level in development. Um, you know, we're, we're very much aware that, that, uh, that, that uh, coal is problematic. On the other hand, our job is to help people have the energy they need to lift their own people out of poverty. So uh, it's a tough, you know, this is, this is why I'm in this job. It's a, it's a, it's a tough negotiation. Um, you know, we, we want to do everything we can to lower the use of coal. Uh, but we can't turn our backs when poor countries need um, energy uh, in order just to light homes and provide heat. On the flip side, the World Bank is in Washington. It's the World Bank, but the US is its largest shareholder. You wrote a column in the uh, Washington Post yesterday making some of the points that you've made here. A response today from a, a lobbyist and a columnist for the Post, uh, Ed Rogers, um, a Republican who says, Republicans unite, America's way of life is being threatened <coughs> by global warming zealots who want to mindlessly raise American power bills. I hope Congress pay attention to how Kim is spending his time and performing at the World Bank. The accusation is that when, when you talk about carbon markets, when, you, when we talk about uh, prices for fuel, that it's, a, it's price hikes, that it's, it's tax increases. How do, you, how do you challenge that argument with the knowledge that the purse strings for the World Bank are somewhat controlled by Congress. Yeah. Um, you know, um, I've been trained in science, and I have young children, and I've looked carefully at the science. Um, there is some 97% agreement that uh, man-made climate change is reality, that it's connected to these extreme weather events, that we could really be living in a four degrees Celsius world. So um, uh, quite apart from any of those considerations, the political considerations, uh, I feel like I have to tackle this issue just as a matter of conscience. Um, and also, um, if you're a scientist and you see there's 97% convergence, it's surprising. I mean, we're almost worried 
when we see 97% convergence. I know very few things in medicine on which there's 97% convergence. This is real. And uh, uh, if this were just a doomsday story and all we were saying is price hikes and you know, um, uh, the, the future is bleak, that's not what we're saying. We're saying that a future that is fueled by renewable sources of energy, by cleaner sources of energy in the interim, that's an exciting future. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a future that we can all look forward to. And what we need to do is to begin talking more about the exciting future that lies ahead of us if we take action together. I'm very encouraged by the fact that uh, President Obama has been so clear on tackling climate change. And I'm sure that we're going to have these discussions. And I would simply say that um, anyone who wants to talk with me, uh, challenge me on this issue, we're, we're, ready, to, we're ready to go. And it's really about people having children and grandchildren. It's really about the world that we want to leave behind. Um, uh, if we're serious about um, you know, our, our, our care for our children and our grandchildren, then I think we have to take it seriously. What's your message for businesses? Because obviously uh, at Davos, uh, a huge amount of, uh, of business executives. Can they play a part, and what is that part? Well, you know, uh, um, uh, what, 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 um, we, the point that we try to make in the Washington Post, which uh, a little bit, um, I think, uh, indirectly, is that uh, the only way for, that we're going to actually tackle this is to get market forces moving. Uh, once people start making money off of climate change mitigation and adaptation, once they start seeing clearly what the price of carbon will, carbon will be and adjust, I think that um, uh, there's a lot of money to be made um, in, in uh, building the kind of technologies and doing the kind of work that will help us bend the arc of climate change, as you, as, as, as you guys have titled it. <laughs> so we actually want them to think in, in, the, in the most um, uh, innovative and entrepreneurial ways about how they can help us move toward this uh, um, uh, environment, uh, climate-friendly future. Without the private sector getting involved, without the private sector taking advantage of, uh, of, uh, of uh, the opportunities, we're not going to be able to tackle this problem. This has got to be a market-driven uh, approach. Will it take more superstorms and, and droughts to make this, to really push this forward? And it's obviously not the driving force we want, but do, do you feel that the superstorm, Sandy, for example, has, has given a, a, a change in, a, in focus on this debate, made it a, a, more, a more real world debate? Well, we, we have to keep up a steady drumbeat in between the, uh, the extreme uh, weather events. We have to keep talking about what's happening. We have to keep talking about um, you know, basic things like when you have, uh, you, you know, the, the, the oceans are getting a little bit warmer. What, what's that really going to mean? I think our role at the bank is to, is to continue to make clear the impact this is having on poor people. I mean, I think, I think people in uh, the wealthy countries over the last few years have shown that they're extraordinarily compassionate. <clears throat> in the worst economic times, uh, the, the, the high-income countries were very generous to the World Bank and to other agencies. So, so we think there's a tremendous um, uh, a reservoir of compassion. We simply have to keep telling the story. But the extreme weather events are going to have a very powerful impact on people's understanding of the role of climate change. What about your clients, the people who you're, you're trying to help? Are they interested? Are they engaged in this? Or do, do they feel that they're, they're, they're missing other <coughs> things that will... Uh, let me, let me give you an example. You know, the largest emitter we know is China. Um, I was just there and meeting with the, uh, the future premier, Li Keqiang. And he specifically talked to me about this issue. And what he asked me to do was to focus on urbanization. He says, you know, for us, urbanization is about food security, health, education, not just roads and buildings. And more than anything else, it's about climate. We want to build a green future. We, we wrote a report with them about what a green Chinese economy would look like. <clears throat> and they've set some really aggressive targets. They want to decrease the carbon intensity by 40 to 45 percent by 2020. So they have a plan. They're being very aggressive. Yes, they're building uh, uh, coal-fired plants, but they have a plan uh, of how to move forward with their green economy. I mean, they're feeling it directly. They're, you know, the, the people are having more respiratory illnesses. There's a lot of complaints in China. <clears throat> so even in the highest emitter, there's a great interest. Also, in the developing countries, interestingly, the market and demand for renewable energy is going up very, very quickly. So um, there, is a, there is a concern. I think they do get it. I, I think they would love to be able to move toward uh, renewables. Um, it, we just need to be um, ready to, to, to help them when that's the case. You're only six months into your term. What would you, <coughs> given the challenge on this, what would you like at the end of your term to at least have achieved? What do you think is 
acceptable? You might have a not ambitious, but what's your what do you think is an acceptable uh, result at the end of your term on climate change? Well, um, um, at the end of five years, I I'd like to have all three of our projects um, either completed or really um, on the move. So carbon market, removal of fuel subsidies, uh, 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 a reasonable uh, evidence-based approach to uh, mega cities. I I I'd like to see all of them in place in the next five years. And for what, what, what will require that, a, a, a political push or a business push or a, a, from a voter level push? I, you know, I think we have to work on it um, uh, with all our parties. I mean, the good thing is that um, you know, we're engaged with the private sector. We're engaged with, of course, our, our, um, uh, our, our member countries. Uh, I think everyone will have to work together. And, and we're going to have to have this discussion in the, um, uh, in, in our, in, with our board, with our governors, with the ministers of finance. Um, but um, I'm optimistic. I, I, I think it'll happen. Um, uh, I think there will be more extreme weather events. I mean, there are extreme weather events right now. The extreme cold, you know, um, uh, here uh, in Europe, you know, Australia is is is, uh, is suffering a severe drought. You know, as these things happen more frequently, I, I think it'll drive uh, the world toward asking fundamental questions about well, why is this happening? Then we can talk about the science, and we can talk about really large bore projects um, that could take us toward solutions. And it also seems that this could be a driver for economic growth. Something it has to be. It has to be. We will not be able to tackle climate change unless it's a driver of economic growth. If it's simply, if it's simply a vision of doing less, it, I, I just don't think it's going to work. Because doing less means that we can't lift more people out of poverty. So our dual goal of ending poverty through growing economies and creating a cleaner future, we think those are compatible. That's the great news. That's the optimism. That's, that, that, that's, the, that, that's the bright vision of a future that we've got to talk about. You know, the, the, if climate change is just about doing less in a bleaker future, again, I don't think, I don't think we'll be able to tackle it. We've got to look at the growth opportunities, look at the, tra the, the, the transformational societies we can build. And what's next for you? What's your, your work for the next year? Uh... Well, it, it, it's really to, to talk with all our um, partners and the constituent bodies about how we can get these three uh, major efforts going. In the meantime, we're doing other things. We're working on sustainable agriculture. You know, climate smart agriculture is a, an area that we need to make some movement on. Um, just today, I was talking with uh, former Secretary General Kofi Annan, who has a deep interest in this area. We, we can, we can, we can um, uh, build climate smart agriculture in Africa in ways that could be very, very helpful. So. Um, uh, there are lots of other things to do, but we want to get those large projects. We do have other things that we do. You know, we, we do uh, work on uh, many, many other areas. Um, you know, we, we, we work on uh, uh, health and education. We're, I'm involved in all of those areas. But this has got to be uh, one of our very top priorities. Right. Well, it sounds like after six months, you've got a uniting force here. <laughs> the, the, your, the, your, the, the climate change is perhaps the, 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 the agenda setting for the, for the World yeah. Bank, and, and, and through it you're able to pick off various bits that have all been together, but you've drawn, the, drawn a line you, between You know, Simon, let me just say that uh, for us, it's never an issue that's the driving force. It's people. Right? Our focus is on ending poverty, and our focus is on ending poverty, especially for children. And if you really care about the children, you've got to care about climate change. So the reason I've spent the first six months saying, what are our fundamental values? We're talking about our values at the bank. What are our values? And what does the evidence tell us about how we can move toward those values? If our, if our fundamental value is ending poverty, then lots of things flow from that. We care about people living in poverty. Then if you care about people living in poverty, for all the reasons that I mentioned, the fact that they're so vulnerable to climate change, you've got to care about climate change. You've got to care about energy. You've got to care about you know, access to, to health care, uh, healthcare, education. Um, that's what's so exciting about being at the World Bank, that it's not a bank thinking about the return on loans. It's a bank that has money, thank God, and what we think about is how do we end poverty. What a, what a great opportunity. President Kim, thank you very much. Thank you, Simon. Right.